Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. I'm delighted to welcome our guests today, Alex McNaughton and Scotty Freeman, the founders of Apprento. When we talk to founders of organizations, we normally only manage to get one of the founders in the room to talk with us. So it's great to have both of you with us today. But more than that, as experienced salespeople, sales leaders, and sales trainers, I'm keen to hear about your views regarding the role of sales, and in particular B2B sales, in business development. Kia ora, Alex and Scotty. Kia ora. Um, before we dig into Apprento, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, how did you two meet? How did your paths cross? Um, well, I was, <laughs> how far back do we need to go? But I was doing some advisory work with a, um, a client in New Zealand and I helped them hire a senior sales leader. And I didn't know, but he knew Scott and Scott had been talking to him around the initial concept for a printer and um, we got introduced and it was in the middle of lockdown and we had a number of Zoom calls and then by the end of lockdown we were already in business together right. and we sort of hashed it out. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd been looking for a, I suppose, a partner in crime to, uh, to, to an expert, more of an expert in the, in the training area and uh, the sales education space and I'd met a few people and none had really, I suppose, got the, the, the vision or the, um, I suppose, the understanding of sales, sales today and what, what that is. And, but also somebody who's passionate about uplifting sales capability, particularly in New Zealand. And uh, so I kept going on this journey and as I say, just by chance, this, uh, this particular gentleman, Jason, said, oh, you need to meet, you need to meet Alex. And, um, here we are, what's that, two, <laughs> two years two, on nearly, <coughs> nearly probably, two, probably is, yeah it would be about two years on from when we met. Nearly two years ago, yeah. so um, yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's been a great journey. Yeah. So, so have you always been in sales? Um, no, so I, I guess my journey started here at, at Auckland University. Um, I was studying finance and accounting because that's what my dad did and that's about as much thought as I gave it. And then two years into my degree and I was really not enjoying it. Um, I, did the, didn't, I, I clearly stuck, like picked the wrong thing to study. And by chance I did an internship at a tech startup yep. and that turned into a sales role which then about 12 months later turned into a sales leadership role and I was managing a team of 15 and looking after like multi-million dollar accounts which was kind of crazy as a I think 21, 22 year old, and yeah. but I just got hooked, and that was the start of my sales career. Okay, mm. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause you there because yeah. we've got a technical problem, and everyone's complaining that our oh, sounds no. horrible, um, and I'm just going to quickly fix that. I'm going to, I'm going to be really um, brutal. I think what I'm going to do is switch to this mic entirely. Um, oh, should pick us all up, and if it doesn't, um, my partner in crime will increase the volume, and I'm going to unplug Bits. this. Well, this one not work. That, that's not working for some reason. Okay. Um, okay. So, does the sound? How, how's the sound sounding now? It's sounding good for me. It's sounding good for you. Yeah, I'm not getting any feedback. Okay. And how's the sound now for you? Is that still good for you? Yeah. It's okay. Good. We'll just go with this one mic then. Okay. Um, so, um, I'll just... So, do you, I can, I can um, talk about my journey into sales. I, uh, I finished my studies in England, uh, necessity to, to find a job for another 18 months. Uh, that prolonged the uh, necessity to, to find a job for another 18 months. Uh, that prolonged the uh, necessity to, to find a job for another 18 months. That prolonged the... Uh, necessity to, to find a job for another 18 months, prolonged the uh, necessity to, to find a job for another 18 months. And then I came back and thought, no, I still don't know what I want to do. And I spoke to the police, the army, FMCG companies, graduate programs, and my grades weren't amazing. So I, 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 I just spoke to a lot of people and, and eventually a guy, <coughs> I remember the conversation, I was at a graduate fair in London, and he said, um, what do you do? You, do you want to be in a fast-paced environment? I said, yeah, sounds good. He said, do you want to solve problems? I said, yeah, that sounds good. He said, do you, want, do you like working with people? I said, that sounds. He said, do you want to earn good money? I said, yeah, no, yeah, that's. 
said, well, look, you should, uh, you should come along and think about working in sales. And so the next thing, I, I found myself working for a, a company which was a, a, a recruitment company, which is very much a sales role, and also um, they also sold sales training as well. So I, I fell into it, but then there was a point at which I decided to choose it. And um, that's the common story of, of lots of people that we that we encounter who are in sales. They, they sort of fall into it as if it was the uh, the, the the place to go um, because nothing else was available. And um, we're we're on a mission to change that perception. Yeah. So because people fell into it, I presume they weren't necessarily good at it, or they weren't as good as they might be. I'm, I'm trying to get at what's what. What drove you then to the print home? What, um, what, what, what was the pain point you were trying to, to address? It's, it's, a, it's a really good question. I suppose it's definitely true that some of the wrong people get into sales. Um, but I, I guess one of, one of the key pain points we saw, there's a few, but one of the key ones is this delta between really good buying experiences and really terrible buying experiences. Um, and you know, part of that is the wrong people getting into sales. And part of that is the right people don't actually know about sales as a career too, um, which is part of our mission is to change that and professionalize B2B selling and then also create exciting career paths into it that you know people can be proud of and people actually want to get into. So yeah. are people not proud to be in sales then? <clears throat> Lots of people aren't. Lots of people aren't. Yeah, right? lots of people aren't. They, they think because it's... Uh, I think there's a few different reasons for it, and I think one of them is that there are very low barriers, no barriers to getting into to sales. So if you think about law or accounting or the yeah. trades, you, you have to go through a pathway. You have to meet a certain level of qualifications. And in, in many of those professions, what we call you have to do... CPD hours, continuous uh, professional development hours. Whereas in sales, you just need a phone. Really, that, that that's that's all you need to become a salesperson. So I think what that does, it attracts the wrong people into the profession. There's no accountability for development in the profession, and and therefore we get a, 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 a you know just a a real mix of terrible behaviours. Um, which so, so just, yeah. that, that begs the question which Matt has asked. Matt says, um, what would you say are the key sales skills that you look for when you're trying to connect talent with organisations? So we use a software platform as part of our assessment process. So we actually quantifiably know what good looks like in various different sales and customer facing roles. So. A good example is if you're in a new business focused sales role, as in you're a hunter, you're out there trying to win new clients all the time, then you need uh, a high handling authority trait or preference is, is, is how we talk what about it. What does that mean? So handling authority is, um, if I'm talking to someone more senior than me hierarchically in a business, I can talk to them on a level and I won't be afraid to challenge them, mm -hmm. respectfully, but I won't be afraid yeah. to. Um, so that's one example of a uh, specific behavioral preference that we look for for a new business focus role um, but it, it, if someone wouldn't know that until they came to meet us but so it, to assess it for yourself you know that if you get energy from others and you enjoy finding out about people and you're curious and you like to move things along or take take uh, charge of situations then that might tell you that sales could be could be something for you spend your time there'll be some clues that um, and that can make it harder it's open to anyone from any background um, and that can make it harder to it's open to anyone from any background um, and that can make it harder to open to anyone from any background um, and that can make it harder to find the right anyone from any background um, and that can make it harder to find the right people because um, we've, we've got a you know potentially a massive population unlike other professions where it's very distinct you have to go on that pathway so if I'm asked the flip side of that question, are there any attributes that you'd see in people and you think sales is defin not, definitely not what you should be doing? So it's a tough question because here's the thing. Anyone can be good at selling. I can be taught to be good at selling. I don't have a particularly good sales profile. Like in terms of if, if you, like from what we look at, 
just based on data, my profile is not optimal for a sales role. However, I was very successful in selling. Um, but I didn't stay in it that long. I only stayed in it for about six or seven years. Yeah. Um, so if you're hiring someone, there are certain things you would look for and say, actually, this person might not, they, they might be able to be good at selling one day, but they're not necessarily gonna stick it out as a career. So yeah. like Scotty, you've got, you had an example of this, or it might've been um, our staff member, Shiv, who had an example of this, when they spoke to a spoke to someone whose profile was a bit off, yeah. and then when we probed and asked some questions, it turns out that person actually didn't want to really get into sales. They wanted to go down a consulting pathway, and that's actually where they saw their career going. Yeah. Um, yeah. If the thought of um, working with people or speaking to strangers uh, scares you or doesn't doesn't interest you, then sales is. is I mean, that's one of the, the, the famous author who who wrote um, to sell as there is, and this is by Daniel Pink, who's a, the famous author who who wrote um, to sell as human. He talks about. Um, ambiverts and, and a lot of people have the stereotype of this the salesperson is this extrovert who talks all the time and is so you know gregarious and uh, and he did studies which suggested that actually wasn't true and it was someone who's more of an ambivert which means that they um, at times might just enjoy being on their own they get energy from themselves but in the right listening question probably better that you're not well actually no not, i just there's, there's, there's a book about this yeah. another book called the introvert uh no I that well actually no not, i just there's, not, a, there's a book about this yeah. another book called the introvert's edge I that way you can't have a conversation with someone then maybe that's a challenge yeah. <laughs> so introverted you can't have a conversation with someone then maybe that's a challenge <laughs> yeah. so introverted you can't have a conversation with someone then maybe that's a challenge <laughs> yeah. but introverted you can't have a conversation with someone then maybe that's a challenge <laughs> yeah. but but you can't have a conversation with someone then maybe that's a challenge <laughs> yeah. but you can still be successful as an introvert in selling yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you can still be successful as an introvert in selling. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. But you can still be successful as an introvert in selling. Yeah. yeah. And, and sales is very much about process. So this fallacy that it's just about talking and, and that, that's not true. So if, a, if an introvert can follow a process and see that a sales conversation is a process and mentally get that in the right space, then possibly They'll have to work harder at doing that, but yeah. it's it's a possibility, okay. um, but probably the minority. Often over overly extroverted people are not so good at selling because they talk about themselves all the time and they don't ask enough questions and listen. And there's a lot of data on this. The top sales calls, for example, are where a sales rep speaks for between one third and half the time. Um, now, someone who is overly on the extroverted scale is quite often prone to filling up conversation too much yeah. so it is a balance so and, and actually it's a really important thing to take into account I mean, i'm jumping ahead there but if you're depending on where you start you're going to have to work on different things so if you're an introvert you're going to have to work on different things to be really good at selling if you are overly extroverted you might have to work on other mm. traits to be the best possible salesperson you can be yeah. 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 Hey, aj has a question yeah, clearly he's been doing his homework he says I can see that you have train your team service listed with, within your website. How do you train the sales team members to react and perform in a changing world? How do you have your sales how do you have sales teams tackle the changes that are, that are happening? So for example, you know, you might have a high performing sales team and along comes COVID. <laughs> um, mm. and what was working may no may no longer be possible. Yeah. Um so this is a really common one, especially over the last few years, right? Um, so one of the things that we've observed and from speaking to a lot of sales leaders is that some of the, and I'm, I'm not being ageist, but it's just some of the older sales folks who've been in the game for a long time and used to selling over coffees and lunches really struggled when we moved to a fully remote environment overnight. Yeah. They, they didn't know how to sell over Zoom. They'd never done it before because all their business for the last 20 years had been done you know, over a drink, over a coffee. So, um, you know, that's been a challenge for some companies in terms of how we address that. Um, we have to, um, so a good example, 
know, think back all their in-person meeting time with prospecting on LinkedIn and sending out, you know, one replaced all their in-person meeting time with prospecting on LinkedIn and sending out, you know, a hundred replaced all their in-person meeting time with prospecting on LinkedIn and sending out, you know, a hundred new all their in-person meeting time with prospecting on LinkedIn and sending out, you know, hundred new connection requests a day. So that worked for a time very, very effectively, but six new connection requests a day. So that worked for a time very, very effectively, but six months later, 12 months later, suddenly you've got LinkedIn fatigue and then your approach to doing that same kind of outreach has to change accordingly. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, th I think the other thing is that, um, some stuff has changed, but some stuff hasn't changed yeah. in, in terms of what sales is sales is about identifying a need or solving a problem connecting with someone and moving through a process to a point of a, of a close uh, where that person is satisfied with the solution and then there's ongoing satisfaction from the product or service so some of that hasn't changed since they were probably you know selling the very first um, you know wheel or whatever whatever it was uh, so I think the it, it using is around mindset yes there is some process change we're using Zoom, we use, but I think that the challenge was is that um, takers, they're literally turning up and saying, <clears throat> would you like the blue one or the pink one? Or how, so what we call order takers, they're literally turning up and saying, <clears throat> would you like the blue one or the pink one? Or how many of what we call order takers, they're literally turning up and saying, <clears throat> would you like the blue one or the pink one? Or how many of these would you like? Those people got found out because we actually had to go into what sales actually is, which is about doing the hard work of identifying a, a prospect engaging with them, getting their attention, engaging with them in a professional manner. And that all had to be done um, remotely. Um, that, that couldn't be done in person. Um, but that's becoming more common now for the sales profession. And if we look at the, the rise of the technology industry, particularly in New Zealand, most of the, you know, we're selling globally, we have to, um, to grow a company. So a lot of that has forced the sales process to be done, to be done remotely. And so a lot of people coming into sales for the first time now, that's all they know. So thinking about that global side of sales for New Zealand companies, mm. what's New Zealand sales like in comparison to say sales in the US? Are we as mature, as sophisticated? Um, how, how, do, how do we rank? It's a spectrum. But the short answer is we are a lot less mature in terms of um, how we approach B2B selling, both from a, across all areas really, but like sales strategy wise, um, we often undercook it. Uh, from a process and technology adoption perspective, we're often quite lacking. So for example, for every two or three, so for, sorry, for every one piece of technology we're using in New Zealand, across our sales process in America, they're using two to three. Um, so we're, we're slower to adopt tech, although that's getting better, but we have been slower to adopt tech. And we spend significantly less on sales, enable, sales enablement than our US counterparts. So sales enablement <laughs> is? Uh, tech, training, support, anything yeah. to get the most out of your sales team. So for every dollar we spend, they're spending about four. Yeah. Um, so we've got a bit of, we've got a long way to go. Um, there's also some cultural differences, that I think. New Zealand businesses at a big disadvantage when, you know, the, the New Zealand market is just so big, you have to sell overseas, and yet yeah. you're not geared up to be yeah. as good as the people in, in that foreign yeah. market. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it's hard. I, we, we've changed over the last few years, say we, New Zealand, as you know, traditionally it was a nation of commodities and and you know really commodity trading you couldn't even call it selling I'd argue is is about price um, now we're into this world of you know very much technology and and complex solving problems and <clears throat> that means our whole sales capability has to be lifted so we are we've, we've made a start don't get me wrong there are some companies doing some great things and we've got we've got a long way to go and you know that that starts with again people at school at university saying well what is sales is it a profession I actually want to get into rather than uh, okay well, that's the thing I'll do because I, I don't know what else I'm gonna do yeah. the other can I just make another point on this like on this a lot of Kiwi companies I think looked at this really the wrong way it was the biggest like the last two years has been the biggest opportunity for the New Zealand tech industry ever because suddenly the playing field was completely leveled 
whether you had a travel budget didn't matter anymore. So your buying experience, whether you're buying from Microsoft in the Valley yeah. versus a Kiwi startup out of their garage is exactly the same. It's a white background round Zoom call. So it was actually this massive opportunity and like lots of Kiwi tech companies really ran with it, but yeah. not all of them did. Yeah, but I've heard that from other speakers, yeah. But, you know, realistically our startup ecosystem doesn't have as much money in terms of funding so we need to be that bit sharper as a nation in terms of our actual selling capability almost to, uh, because we don't have as much money to invest in the tech and tools often yeah. so we actually just need to be even better at actually selling yeah. and that's actually I think one of the biggest opportunities we have as a nation is if we really nail it um, in a global virtual first kind of sales environment there's no reason we can't win yeah. I remember talking to one um executive at an electronic company here in New Zealand, he says, we've got the best products. Every time we go to the States, we get beaten because they're better at selling than we are. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. um, talk, talking to sales, um, which we are at the moment, uh, Megan says, um, sales and marketing, marketing often get lumped together. What's your <laughs> advice to support company leaders to discern the difference? Um, so. I, I sp I've spoken at marketing conferences about this and one, one of the things that's funny with sales and marketing is they're often at loggerheads with each other as well. They often don't get on too well. Um, so what companies should be doing is they should be op uh, adopting a revenue operational approach, not a sales marketing success uh, support approach. Like we need to move away from the siloed approach and actually put a revenue hat on centered around um, good customer outcomes and have shared KPIs across sales and marketing. You know, the customer journey covers this entire spectrum of sales, marketing, customer success, and support, yet traditionally in business, we've treated them separately. Yeah. Um, so to answer the question, I think the best thing to do actually for companies, and there's a lot of data actually out of like Forrester Research and um, oh, I forget the other big consulting firm. Gartner. Gartner, that's the one, uh, where it's something like, uh, the, Companies grow like two times faster if they have a revenue operational approach versus a traditional siloed approach. They have like a, I think it's two or three times better return on ad spend, uh, higher customer satisfaction, like you name it, the, the numbers are there. So that would probably be the best way to um, for Kiwi companies to actually adopt, best thing for Kiwi companies to adopt. And more of them are. Mm. It's, yeah. a new, it's a relatively new, for New Zealand, it's a relatively yeah. new position. So in the States, this revenue chief revenue officer or <clears throat> Remy operations leader uh, sits over them both. So make sure that the process between them both is, is flowing and they work together. Um, we're I think last year there was, uh, there was, there was five chief yeah, revenue officers. Five. five chief revenue officers in, in New Zealand with that title. So yeah. we see more coming as, as these companies you know move from the SME into the mid size and bigger. Um, and, and, and as always, we, we take our lead from what's happening in the States and, and you know, that's, that's where they're at. So we're getting there. Can we talk a little bit about Apprento for a moment? Yeah. Um, Matt's curious, he says, so since starting your company, what assumptions around leading a business have you had to challenge? <laughs> this, this is about your own leadership. <clears throat> what assumptions about leading a business have you had to challenge? Um, that everyone understands what you're talking about, I think, and everyone will understand that after saying it once. Um, I think that you cannot underestimate the significance of repeating uh, messages, especially around things like uh, vision and, and values and purpose. Um, you know, just because you've got it in your head, you might have had it in your head for years. Um, mm -hmm. Someone may have only heard something for the first time. So yeah. I think that the, the communication piece is is, yeah, is, is massive. And, and, and even talking about sales and what sales is, you know, we just have to say that the whole time. You know. I, I would have thought as sales people, you were the consummate communicators. It's really funny. I, I've, I've advised companies for the last three years and I've done like 120 plus companies I've advised and then coached sales teams and sometimes it's hard to eat your own medicine mm. and academically knowing what you need to do and then doing it 
whilst having to wear all the other different leadership hats and product hat and this hat and the other hat, um, that's probably one of the hardest things yeah. that mm. me personally that mm. I've I've noticed on this Apprento journey is um, sometimes you got to ask for help too and get other people to um, kind of pull you out of the weeds and work on the business. Yeah, I think the, the other thing I'd add is that, is that as salespeople. We are, we are big promo, p- proponents of questioning and listening. So believe it or not, we, 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 don't, you know, we don't go out there shouting, going, hey, you need sales, <laughs> sales is rah, rah, rah. And yet we need to market ourselves as well. Yeah. So there is a balance of, of promoting ourselves without looking like um, you know, we, we, we're arrogant or, you know, so I, I find that as, you know, that, that's a fine line. I think the other thing as leadership that I've had to challenge is um, myself is just the importance of systems and processes. Good systems and processes for everything done well, the first time if you can, but that, that, that's, that never happens. So but to get to, before you get too big and get going, get good systems and processes in place. Um, it will make your life so much easier. And that comes naturally to some people. Um, it doesn't come as naturally to me, so I've been fortunate to get, you know, get help from others in that regard. Yeah. Thank you. I have to smile when you say that, because when you're talking about sales, you talk about sales as a process. Uh, yeah. So I think of, I, I've been thinking of you as a strongly right, so, driven person. <clears throat> no. Don't get me involved in accounting, or don't get me involved in the legal side of being a business. You know? mm. Don't get me involved in accounting, or don't get me involved in the legal side of the business. You know. Mm. Don't get me involved in accounting, or don't get me involved in the legal side of the business. Like that's completely over my head. Yep. But that requires a process too. Like everything requires yeah. a process. Yeah. So we, we've got a couple of questions I'd, I'd like to get through. Um, so AJ's interested to know what risks you uncovered when you were starting up, and how did you handle those risks? Because um, some things just aren't apparent until you um, start a business. <laughs> well, I think the, f- the first risk was that uh, our initial business model was that we were going to gather lots of people in a room, uh, give them information and, and run them through some exercises. And uh, about two weeks later, COVID hit. So I thought, right, well, I mean, it, it forced us to say, well, look, we're going to have to do this online. On the line and tell my family they've got to eat, you know, bread and drink water for us and on the line and tell my family they've got to eat, you know, running a business. And at the same time, management of risk. Yes, it is a risk starting a business. And at the same time, management of risk. Yes, it is a risk starting a business. And at the same time, it's not of risk. Yes, it is a risk starting a business. And at the same time, it's not a risk. Yes, it is a risk starting a business. And at the same time, it's not a crazy. Yes, it is a risk starting a business. And at the same time, it's not a crazy. It is a risk starting a business. And at the same time, it's not a crazy wild, you know, wild risk. Yes, mm. there's things that come up that you don't realise. And I think the biggest thing is that you know we've got a vision of what we want to do with the business. We you know we want to professionally educate every every salesperson and help them deliver results. So if we keep that in mind, you're able to sort of navigate um, the risks as they come up. And I think you, if you choose to start a business, you've got to expect risks and, and, and things like that that are going to come up. And it's more the mindset of, right, how do we get around this one? Um, as opposed to going, oh, this is it, we should yeah. close up. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned revenue growth. Um, and Angela's booked on that. She says, are the skills required to sell for revenue growth different than the skills required for negotiating a large deal, perhaps? Fundamental, fundamentally, no. Like, fundamentally, it's it's very similar, because ultimately, when we talk about sales, what are we actually teaching people? We're teaching people how to people, how do you listen, how to interact with other people. That's what selling is, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, that it might get the other person to rethink their original position. Mm-hmm. So um, that it might get the other person to rethink their original position. Mm-hmm. So um, negotiating a deal whether you're buying or selling, uses a lot of the same fundamental principles and skills. And you know, one thing I think we're both really passionate about is sales as a skill is not just suitable for selling. <laughs> it actually can make every aspect of your life better. You know, friendships, relationships, how you interact with your family. Like everything can be better 
if you can learn to be better with people. Mm. Um, so, short answer, no. I don't think there's actually that much difference. I think that I'm not going to completely disagree. I think this, there is a subtle difference, and, and this is just in the sales process and when different people can come in at different times. So if you think about the start of a sales process, which is about engaging with people and uh, perhaps people you don't know, and, and we call it lead generation or top of the funnel, and then you move along to sort of negotiating, negotiating a deal, it can be a bit of a bit of difference there. If you were just given a deal to negotiate, then you could do that if you're a smart person. Um, doing this part here, the lead generation, the prospecting, quite often is, it's an entry level role with a lot of time on the a lot of time on the phone and really, um, I suppose, being super resilient and and, and sort of a, a, a being steadfast. I think that is is something which a lot of people don't understand about sales, um, or that's why a lot of people aren't suitable just to get through the you know I think there is a little bit of difference to it but ultimately again it is is about the you know your understanding there is a little bit of difference to it but ultimately again it is is about the you know your understanding there is a little bit of difference to it but ultimately again it is is about the you know your understanding your ability to, to deal with people and, and is that true regardless of the size of the company? I mean, is sales different in big companies to small companies fundamentally? The, the bigger difference is actually who you're selling to, not who you're selling for. So if you're selling to big companies, your sales process might take 12 months, whereas if you're selling to small companies, it might take two weeks. Um, so it's actually more important who you're selling to versus um, who you are when you're selling because the sales, the sales process has to be aligned to how your buyer wants to buy from you. So there's no point in trying to cram a small to medium and a small to medium business sales process if you're trying to sell to the biggest top 500 companies in the world. It's not going to work. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's actually dictated to by the customer who's buying mm -hmm. more so than um, you. Yeah, it, it shouldn't be different. And what we still find though is obviously companies are starting out tend to have little if not no sales process yeah. uh, not all and actually some who are starting out get that right straight away the go-to market strategy how they're going to go uh, versus the, the ones that have been around for a while tend to have you know better better systems and process in place yeah. so um, that can be a hard place to start if you go into a company you know it might have a great product but if they haven't figured out their sales process yet yeah. um, buy you know buyer beware or, or can they beware? We, we, we've talked a lot there about the people actually doing the sales. What about the people leading sales teams? You know, I, I imagine that many of those people come out of being salespeople themselves, and I wonder to what extent the things that made them good as a salesperson will or won't make them good as a leader of a sales team. <laughs> We, 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 we really do sales leaders a massive disservice because what we typically do is we promote the top salesperson yeah. and then suddenly you're a sales leader and then we give them no training, no um, support, no guidance and they often revert to what they're good at which is selling and fall into like a player coach kind of role um, which doesn't scale particularly well. Um, so the... the <laughs> The skill set for a sales leader and a salesperson, there's some commonality, but there's some pretty substantial differences too. And the top salesperson is not always necessarily the best sales leader. Almost never, actually, when yeah. you think about it. Yeah, yeah. I, the, the, the sales leader, and a lot of it is about motivation and drive, and the sales leader is someone who enjoys getting satisfaction through, through others, through coaching and, and leading mm. others. Quite often the top salesperson is, um, I'm getting that and I'm, I'm about it to go and help Alex in a bad way. And the, you don't need to be a top sales performer to do get it wrong. And the, you don't need to be a top sales performer to be a good get it wrong. And the, you don't need to be more about the person who can create a great culture, a great coaching environment. Yes, they've got a bit more about the person who can create a great culture, a great coaching environment. Yes, they've got about a more about the person who can create a great culture great coaching environment. 
yes, they've got to be able to model and show how to do it, you know, how to conduct a sales process. But quite often, it's about getting that system process and, and getting the right people on the on the bus. Yeah, the key the key skill set for a good sales leader is the ability to coach their team. And top salespeople may be able to do that, but often actually they play a coach. They don't actually um, teach, which is different. Yeah. I, I do wonder whether or not it's hard, even if you wanted to attract those top salespeople into that leadership role, whether it's difficult to get them across the line, because I imagine for some of them, it could represent quite a big pay cut. Totally. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Often the best or some of the best paid people in certainly big tech organizations are your top gun sales folks. And you would never catch them dead in a sales leadership position because it means they're gonna like earn half their pay. Mm. And and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, some people are some people just love that. Yeah. And they're very happy to do that. I know some awesome sales guys and, 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 and girls who have been in roles for 20 30 years just crushing it yeah. and they will do that till the day they retire yeah. and they'll be very happy doing it i think sales is one of the few areas where there's a history of what other people in tech would call individual contributors yeah. where you're valued for the individual contribution you make yeah. rather than okay we're going to value you for your management abilities or your being part being a, a team player as such being a team player is important like so a well functioning sales team you have to still have elements of being able to be a team yeah. player you can't be like too individually focused like you have to have some individual focus because yeah. it's in like you said it's a contributor role but you have to be able to play well with others too yeah. mm. the best sales teams are definitely collaborative in nature mm. but i think that's different to um where you can't be yourself I must confess that in, 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 my, in my younger days, I worked in um, a photocopy company. Oh, right. And photocopier sales. Yeah, yeah. You'd have yeah. been well trained. Yeah. Uh, I, I, no? I, I, I've, I've had, I've had a, an interesting life. Um, <laughs> and their sales, those salespeople were, you know, the good ones, you just point and let go. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. You, you, uh, they would be part of the sales team and they would help the sales team but their ambitions to be anything other than an individual contributor to the firm yeah. was zero. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes. Yeah. And it was wonderful because of that. Yeah. And that, I th that's, that's okay if culturally they're good, they're good people and they're helping out. But I think sales is one of those roles, it's, it's unique in that way, is that there is a marker it, it, it's there. There is a there is a budget. There is a target, and um, you're either delivering or you're not. And so it focuses people on on doing that. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the ch that's the challenge. It's a challenge for management um, because you know there are rewards in sales which promote the wrong behaviours. So I think it's you know that's a whole other conversation around KPIs and rewards and metrics to yeah. make sure that behavior is aligned in the right way and it's also about getting the right people on board first of all see hiring of sales people needs to be um, rigorous and, and done well the other thing on this is what makes a good salesperson in Canon New Zealand might not be the same as a good salesperson at Parkable or EasyVet so there will be subtle differences and, and we take this into account through our assessment process because what we'll actually do is assess an existing team or a high performance an existing team first get their, um, what are the key traits that they have, and then also then include our aggregated data as well to build out a composite profile, because that way we can make sure that there's not only a skill set from a sales perspective match, but then also more of a cult cultural match. Yeah. Because a canon environment is, is like you just described, it's a, here's your territory, off you go. <clears throat> Whereas a parkable environment is very much, it's a startup, we're a small team, so you have to be a lot more collaborative. So they look, so we look for very slightly different things when we're, um, you know, placing people in, in a parkable versus a, a cannon. Going back to your own company, a printer for a moment, Angie wants to know, basically she's asking, how are you going to scale your company? How are you going to grow internationally? Uh, it, you know, in, in some ways, from what you say, it sounds like you've got this great market in New Zealand which is underdeveloped and it's ripe for you to upskill. Yeah, yeah. But it is a relatively small market. Yep, um, yep. How are you going to address the scale issue? Well, I mean, the 
the are we just looking at at the moment? The obvious choice is uh, is Australia, and because we're remote as well, we're able to service that market uh, without too much of an investment in into setting that up. Having said that, we are also look at you know uh, market entry and what's the right strategy. So is that to do a joint venture? Is it to invest in someone or a non-competing business or so that's the the questions and some of the conversations we're, we're having at the moment um, but we feel like we're in a good position to be able to do that as long as we get the systems and processes right so we can pick them up and, and put them in, into australia so i joke a little bit but that is that is you know one of the lessons here of going you know you need to have that stuff tight to be to enable you to scale more easily the cool thing with that model though is it is remote so you know we have online learning and that you know whether you're in the us or here that can be easily used um and then we're building out our training methodology in a way that we can teach other people in different markets to deliver yeah. it so right now we deliver it but um you know long term we'll have a train the kind of trainer approach or we'll have multiple trainers yeah. um and the, the cool thing with the remote business models like ours as well is you actually don't need a massive amount of people to service a lot of like to coach and support and develop a lot of reps so you know one trainer can train you know hundreds yeah. um, maybe more we're, we're figuring out those tolerances right now but it's certainly in the hundreds um, so yeah we're quite excited for, for international growth that's a end of this year end of this year figure is going to be uh, making some big decisions around that I'm not sure if Scotty gave it away by saying Australia or not you're not giving away well that's come out so it's funny because Australia we've had a lot of inbound interest from Australian companies yeah. mm. uh, and from, from contacts we have over there and saying hey when are you coming over here yeah. so um, Australia is a natural choice because it's close the time zone's good we have fairly good networks there already um, but there's opportunity around the world with this like sales has not been cracked anywhere the US I'd say is the furthest ahead but are they perfect? God, no. Um, definitely not. Is Australia pretty much like us in terms of sales and their they're a little position on the continuum? They're a bit better. Um, so Kiwis are a little bit afraid to, and I think it's a cultural thing. Um, Kiwis, and I'm half British, half Kiwi, are a little bit afraid to challenge respectfully and, and ask for the sale. Yeah. Aussies are a little bit more direct, <clears throat> not quite because they try and do it like they're selling to other Kiwis and they're too soft with their because they try and do it like they're selling to other Kiwis and they're too soft with their approach try and do it like they're selling to other Kiwis and they're too soft with their approach whereas the Aussies want them to be more direct and yeah. be like tell me the value and let's yeah. get to that quickly and stop fluffing around yeah. um, Australia's it, it, you know it's a bit it's a bigger market there's more companies more people yeah. like they have to be a little bit more on the game I also just a add to that cultural piece about New Zealand uh, there was a study done by an uh, anthropologist called Michael Henderson uh, not so long ago when he, he interviewed I, I don't know how many people what there were but these are people in sales roles and yeah. the outcome was is that it was 75 percent 77 percent of people who are in sales roles didn't think of themselves as being in sales roles, sales roles or didn't like to think of themselves yeah. as, as being in sales roles and so he points to other markers, you know, like, you know, New Zealand, we've, we've got this Kiwi bird, we're sort of head in the sand, we're a bit understated, it's the colour black, it's, it's, it's the underside of the fern, it, it's not a, culturally it doesn't sit, I don't know whether I totally agree with that, I think, you know, the hat, but I do have strengths and, and, you, and it's again come back to the process and, and what do you do, but I do have strengths and, and, you, and it's again come back to the process and, and what do you do. But I do see some of that, and I, and I wonder if that doesn't help us on the international stage, as, as, as Alex has said. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Get Ma Megan's is curious about your process. And, and uh, from memory, I think Megan's in the training space herself. How might you keep an eye on the quality of your product, the training, through the train the trainer <coughs> approach? How, how to maintain quality as yeah. you go? Mm. I suspect it's this is her saying, because I'm wrestling with this too. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's it's a tricky one. I think it comes down to building the playbooks out, building your playbooks well. So it's the same when we're coaching salespeople. It's 
give them enough resource and support that they can get going, but then also have an accountability framework built in. So that's why our training program is, that's why we believe lifelong learning. And our initial training program is 12 months long, which is different to any other kind of sales education out there, is it's normally, it's a two day workshop. Um, mm. Right? So I think there's a few things. It's one, it's the coaching and the resources you give them. And then it's also, it's the accountability framework and, and some measurement stuff as well. Um, which are all aspects of how we deliver our training today, which will translate those similar principles into how we train trainers to deliver our training. Yeah, I come back to the process. <laughs> you know, it, I, it seems like it's the answer to everything, but have a process around how you're hiring those trainers, who you're looking for. Yeah. Have a profile, have an actual profile. I think in the, particularly in the sales training area, God, there's a real mishmash. Uh, <laughs> and, I, I, and I've seen a lot. And um, so have a profile work out like give them the playbook there's a little bit of room for them to bring in their own stories because you want you want that person to be compelling engaging and, and, and telling stories in the right way but then you've got to have a way of assessing that and, and like Alex said holding them to account and being able to watch them and you know and remotely now you can do that in a much easier way so I think the tools are there um, not easy uh, but there's a process of doing it I think that train the trainer issue is really quite interesting because long history. I've been through so many of those train the trainer programs myself and I know that probably in 90% of them there is none of that being held to account afterwards. It's mm. as you say, two days and then off you go. Mm. Uh, we've done our bit, you do your bit. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah look, thinking further ahead my role will probably move from training sales reps into training sales trainers. Yeah. And funnily enough, that's what I was doing before Apprento really yeah. was so along this time as to how we get most out of people because that's ultimately what we're doing is getting getting more out of people. Like mm. switching on their most out of people because that's ultimately what we're doing is getting getting more out of people. Like mm. switching on their potential. So we're gonna have to take all those learnings that we've had from doing it with sales reps and then just apply it to our own teams. Um, so yeah, it, it's a challenge, but I don't think it's any more challenging than getting going or any other challenge you have. That's kind of the, uh, <laughs> the irrepressibility I associate with sales. <laughs> um, uh, uh, irrepressibility I associate with sales. <laughs> um, uh, ability to tackle change, which goes on to a question that we had from, um, uh, who was it? Uh, I lost it here. Okay, um, so Kevin wants to know, what about the tech that to replace trainers so the learning is more self-paced? So, so, so there's part of that. So all of our learning right now, there's a mixture, so it's blended. So we have online learning, uh, which is self-paced. Yeah. Um, then we have group-based cohort learning. So we have learning cohorts of between roughly f five to six reps in a cohort. Um, and that's where we can, um, you know, they can learn from us, they can learn from each other, practice, get feedback, because online learning, you can't really get any feedback. You learn it, but you, you know, you might do some knowledge checks and so on, but you need in sales certainly is that practice element's really important, which is where those group cohort based sessions come in. Then we also do some one-on-one, -on -one, a little bit of one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, where we can really dig into that individual's, um, behavioral preferences mm -hmm. and give them some very specific individual insights as how they can improve their sales game um, what we might be able to do down the line is bring in like technology there's, there's, there's a bunch of awesome sales enablement technology out there with some AI that can help analyze calls and um, so we can give more feedback at scale yeah. um, so that's probably like yeah. once we're at like a thousand coaching a thousand people then we'll start to look at more of those kind of yeah. tools as well and yeah, I'm curious, yeah. you, you mentioned sales enablement several times, and I'm wondering when you encounter an organization which doesn't have those tools in place, what's your role there? Do you point them to good companies or do you um, partner with good companies to help them? How, how, do, how does that part of your business work? Mm -hmm. What's the honest answer right now? It's kind of well, 
or yeah, recommendations? At, at, at the moment, we don't have a, a partnership with a sales, um, call it a sales enablement technology company. We, we've begun conversations, and there are some interest. There's some interesting tools out there. Like, like one of them is a, is one called Gong, and that enables um, salespeople to record and analyze the conversations to understand what words are being used, what increases the chances of closing the sale. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we see that we can make suggestions and, and as we grow, it, it might be that we actually become you know, a, par a partner. Um, we've actually, we actually reached out to one of the major companies in, um, in the US known for their sales enablement technology and said, hey, we're, we're spearheading the, the revival of sales or the profession in, in New Zealand. And they said, oh, they sort of said, oh, where's, where's that? When, <laughs> so it just wasn't on the radar for that company at the moment. But, yeah. um, although in saying that another one is sponsoring. Although we have got, we've got, a, we have got another one that, that we're just close to sponsoring, sort of a, a, a potentially a, a qualification that we're, that we're doing. So yeah, we, again, it's being in New Zealand. Um, look, part of our role is to stay globally aware of what's happening. Yeah. Uh, make companies aware of what the possibilities are and it may be at some point that we actually are able to implement that as well. The reality is we can't do everything though. No. No. And we operate in a space where there are literally thousands of pieces of technology that companies use. Yeah. And, you know, we can give some advice maybe, mm. but is it really our place to? Yeah. Um, we, can't, we can't solve every problem. No. You know, like we're focusing on <laughs> the people side of it. Yeah. Um, there are other companies that focus on the tech yep. and you know like Scotty said maybe at some point we'll partner with one of them yep. but yeah Go, going back to the tech to replace trainers um, <laughs> Kevin in passing says um, try a bit of VR that's because he's into VR I know. <laughs> um, yeah 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 absolutely it, it's I'm, 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 in fact, I'm positive read about you know the role of VR yeah um, so yeah as head of um, uh, training products Alex, I'm sure we're working on that in his M MPD <laughs> program. So, Helena asked a question going back to sales teams. She says, how have you helped a sales team that did not have a collaborating nature? Um, and how did you make sure that the right culture persists within the team? That sounds like a big hard yeah, question to me. Well, I mean, I can speak from experience being yeah. a sales leader, you know, in a, in a, um, a large company a few years ago now. Uh, it was obvious the culture was was pretty rotten in the team, and that was because of two individuals, a team of seven. And um, I mean, the short answer is that those people probably shouldn't have been in the team in the first place. Um, and I remember it because it was one of my first leadership roles. I was pretty young as, as a leader, and I, thought, ah, I knew what I had to do, and it was it was a hard leadership challenge, and, and that was to make them aware of behaviours, behaviours that they weren't um, adhering to or weren't conducive to, to a good team environment. And then to come back to the process, we went we went through a process and uh, I think they ended up, both, both of them ended up leaving before we had to get to a, a sort of a serious, a serious side. So I, th I think that, you know, you've got to make people aware of behaviours. Some people aren't aware and mm -hmm. some believe, and, and, and they would be mortified you know, I remember working with one guy who um, I didn't realize that um, he was dyslexic. And um, so he would go into meetings and not take any, any notes. Um, and one of the other ladies that used to go to meetings with him, she said, I can't believe he's sitting there not taking any notes. It looks like he's not interested. And yeah. so I said, have you spoken to him? She said, no. I just said, well, maybe, you know, you have a chat to him. Yeah. She came back, she was oh, mortified. He told me he's dyslexic and, and he can't take notes. So he just remembers it all and then has, you know, talk, I think he talked to his girlfriend later on and she took the note. Anyway, yeah. so I was like, wow. I mean, he does all of that to, to, to get through. So, I mean, that's a, probably an extreme example. Um, but if, if you call these behaviors, it's a hard thing to do. You, you, have, you have to call them. You have to have a, a difficult, crucial conversation, whatever it is. Yeah. And you've got to point out the behavior, say it's not acceptable and say that what you know here's the course of action the, the other thing that sales leaders that can be quite powerful is if they um really get to know what the individual motivators for individual team members are um, like if you know where someone's trying to get to in their role or in their career and what motivates them what they enjoy doing um 
then you can effectively sell those behaviors you'd like them to be doing back to them to align with actually what they're trying to achieve with their own life. Mm. Um, and that's why leadership sometimes requires, you've got to sell the, the vision to the mm. team yeah. uh, as to where you're trying to go, like why these behaviors are important for, mm. for what we're trying to achieve as a team. Mm. So, and, and if you ask a lot of questions and do a good sales discovery process on your individual team members, that can actually help you lead more effectively. Yeah, I, I think the, the culture question is massive because it can be a real, it, it can be so sort of vague and, and people think oh, it's about having morning teas and, and it's like, well, you know, you, you can be very purposeful, purposeful around culture, especially in a sales team. Yeah. And, and if you look, you use a, there's a diagnostic tool called the cultural web and, and some useful things in there if you think about, okay, what do we want to reward in our team? Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the stories and the symbols that we, that we talk about in mm -hmm. our team? Um, you know, where's the power structures? Is it, is it the guy who's the top biller? You know, he's, he's got this, you know, is that right? Is that, you know, or should it be everyone's equal? So I think you can purposely design them, but quite often we're going in to take over a team and that can be, that can be quite challenging. Um, if, you know, if you've got one or two who aren't quite right, you've got you to move quickly. Purposeful design is really important. Like sometimes I hear sales leaders saying, oh, the, the, the team's values will seep to the surface. And it's like, no, because if you leave it to that way, then who knows what's gonna to come to the surface. Yeah. Uh, the good might come out, but also the bad. So you have to be purposeful in terms of your values that you want your team to exude. And then values shouldn't just be like buzzwords. It's not like trust and loyalty. It's someone described to me this way, and I think this helps is think about your team values as um, the behaviors you want the team to exhibit when you're not watching them. Yep. and the behaviors you exhibit when they're not watching you. And if you can embed that into your team, then suddenly you actually have a cohesive team. Yep. And then some of those bad folks that maybe don't align with those values, maybe it makes sense to get rid of them. But at least you give them a choice to either get on the bus or not. Um, so yeah, be, being purposeful, that was a really good point, Scotty. Purposeful is, um, is key. We're getting close to the end of our time. I'm, I'm, one of the questions I ask most of our guests is, if you had to do it all over again, what's the one thing, what's the one piece of advice you would give your younger selves? You go first. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Take, take, take a risk, back yourself, go for it. If, if, you've, if you've got enough conviction, belief, um, don't get me wrong, you've, you've got to test your idea a little bit, um, but give it a go. Even if you fail, even you will, you will learn so much from it. You'll feel alive. I, I wish I'd started a Prento 10 years earlier. I've just graduated high school. <laughs> you're, a little bit, you're a little bit younger than that, just a touch. Um, Honestly, would I, ch I wouldn't change anything actually because all the mistakes I made have brought me to this point. However, the one thing I wish I knew was the importance of curiosity at a younger age. So I don't think I really started becoming curious and asking good questions until maybe three years ago. And I, and I, and I look back and I, I realize how much more value I could have had with some of the amazing people that I'd met just through, through sheer luck um, earlier in my life and I didn't ask them like questions I now would have absolutely loved to. Yeah. Um, Cause I wasn't curious. I was kind of, I don't know, focused on dumb teenage stuff. Um, so that's probably the biggest one. And, and I think actually it's one of the biggest life skills is people who are genuinely curious about how things work, about other people. Um, they, they seem to do quite well. Um, when I look, look at like the people I really admire, they're all really, really, really curious. Alex, Scotty, thank you so much for your time today. Thank, thank you, you for your insights. Thank you for your story of Apprento and your insights into sales and sales leadership and managing sales teams. I really appreciate it, clearly by the questions you've been asked. Um, the students have found it interesting as well. That's thank good. you. Pleasure, thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. Right. And we're out. Cool. <coughs> Sorry about the sound problem. <laughs> <laughs>